Good evening. I want us to please go to, in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 1, please, the book of Hebrews chapter 1. <coughs> I'm going to read this marvelous chapter of Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, or in his son, or sunwise, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Being made so much more better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me, be, me, to be, be to me a son. And again when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, O Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. They shall perish, and thou remainest, and they shall wax all the doth of garment, and the vesture shall thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? I want to make some preliminary remarks about this grand epistle. Before we can get to the real nitty-gritty of studying this epistle out, we have to ask two questions. And the two questions that I want to call your attention to, which are very, very important, is who wrote this epistle and why was the epistle to the book of Hebrews or to the Hebrews written? Who wrote this epistle and why and for what purpose was this book of Hebrews written? And this is a very, very important question. And we need to know the backdrop of these mighty epistles. Now, many people, there's been arguments throughout church history who actually is the author of the book of Hebrews. A couple of years ago, I was going to the idea that it wasn't the Apostle Paul. I've since changed my mind. I believe it was the Apostle Paul. I believe there's internal and external evidence that Paul the Apostle penned the book of Hebrews. And I believe, and there's a reason why, and I can give it to you biblically. If you go to the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, You'll see something very, very interesting. We need to know this stuff. <clears throat> in the last chapter, 13th chapter, the 23rd verse, it says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is, Timothy is set as liberty with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Then he says, salute them all that have this that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. They of Rome salute you. Grace be with you all. Kenneth E. Hagen, one of the false prophets of today and the past, or should I rather say of the early 2000s, he went to his reward, claims that he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in one of his visions, he asked Jesus and said to him, who wrote the book of Hebrews? And Kenneth Hagin says, the Lord Jesus Christ told him that Paul wrote it. So that was good enough for him. He doesn't need to find anything else because his personal revelation of it revealed that Jesus, that Paul the apostle wrote the book of Hebrews. Then a couple of years later in the 2008 sham of the revival there at Lakeland, Mr. Todd Bentley, Claimed while he was astral traveling, because these are what these modern day occultic uh, charismatics are doing. They are practicing astral traveling, which is actually forbidden by the word of God. He claims that in Paul's time of astral traveling, he meant he met Paul there, which is spiritualism. He actually was in a form of necromancy and occultism. And Paul the Apostle told him that he got his, the book of Hebrews, it was written by him, but Abraham 
gave him the book of Hebrews. You can't get more bizarre than that. So I reject both of those because I would rather use the word of God to see whether or not Paul did write it and is there evidence that he wrote it. I reject claims like that. Because first of all, the Bible says, study to show yourself approved, a real workman that rightly be not ashamed, handling and rightly dividing the word of truth. I don't pay notice to people who say they have their own personal revelation on something. What I actually do is I go to the word of God and I want to see whether I can find out these things. Uh, you see, when you begin to go to the scriptures, you begin to mine pure gold. And I want to give gold to people. I want something that they can say, this is thought provoking and I find it interesting. Now, in the last verses here, we have the mention of Timothy. Timothy was Paul's pastor, one of the main people that he writes the book of 1 Timothy. So that is very interesting. Some close associate of Timothy is writing the book of Hebrews. Then there's another injunction. It says, grace be with you all. Now go through all the Pauline epistles. There are certain things and certain characteristics that you can see Paul wrote them. At the end of his epistles, and I went through all seven of them, they all have grace be with your spirit, grace and peace be unto you in the Lord Jesus. And even in the book of Romans, although it is five verses before the ending, it is still there. It is the way that Paul always ended his letter. He says, grace and peace or grace be unto you. So that is two of the reasons, I believe, that you could say that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Now I want to give you something else. That's just external evidence, I believe. The very opening verses here of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, is very, very similar to the opening verses of the book of Romans. You've got to compare scripture with scripture. It says exactly the same thing that Romans chapter 1 says, although it leaves out the author. The author, who actually the author is in the book of Hebrews. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised to fall by the prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, etc. and etc. It says exactly the same thing. God, who at sundry times and divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by the Son. It says exactly the same thing. There's a second thing I want to call your attention to. The great third chapter of the book of Hebrews has this glorious beginning. It says over here, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, let's turn over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 1. The similarities between this book of Hebrews and also the other epistles that Paul wrote is incredible. Ephesians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice he uses the term saints and faithful. The same introduction is given in Colossians 1, 1, 2, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, the saints and the faithful. As one Christian said, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, this is the barest minimal essential, essential of what it means to be a Christian. And here, in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, he is exhorting them and he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. He is saying the same things. There are definite similarities in the writing style of the Apostle Paul. Now, there have been arguments for years who have written the book of Hebrews, and it is very, very important that we think about it. Now, just that little introduction could do, you could do your own study and you can find it. Maybe you will disagree with it. It's, it has no bearing on my salvation. Apostle Paul actually wrote the book of Hebrews or not. It really has no bearing. But what I want to do, beloved, is I want to show.
that these things are vitally important. They are vitally important for us as born-again Christians. We know the scriptures, that we know the word of God. Now, I need to ask a question. We've just analyzed, and I've given you my view, that I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I need to ask a question, why did Paul write the book of Hebrews? To what purpose was it written, and to who was it written? Because you will find many people have different views of the the book of Hebrews and about the book of Hebrews, and some views about the book of Hebrews are actually very much heretical. And it comes from good men who actually teach a heretical view of the book of Hebrews. To whom was the book of Hebrews written to? We could ask the question. First of all, there's an old heresy that came in in the 1800s because people didn't like the idea about certain things that the book of Hebrews said. Now, I want to make a statement to you. When your ideas get counteracted by the word of God and the word of God contradicts those ideas, you are to absolutely reject your ideas in favor of the word of God. So when something comes and counteracts the very teaching of scripture, we have to submit ourselves to what the scriptures teach and say, I have to agree with the word of the Holy Spirit. But so many people don't want to do that. They want to fit their ideas and bring the scriptures into their ideas. And thus they mold the scriptures and they do it to their own peril. If you believe something that contradicts something that is written in the book of Hebrews under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice the first words that we read was God is the very author of the scriptures. God is the author of the Old Testament and God is the author of the New Testament. If it contradicts basic Bible doctrine, basic Bible teaching, I'm telling you now, we have to accept what the Bible says and we have to take the Bible at face value and not try and fit the scriptures into our preconceived notions because you make, you, 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 you get into tremendous amount of trouble when you begin to do that. So if something comes along and contradicts what is written in the word of God, we stand in favor upon the word. We stand in favor for what the scriptures teach. Then we do justice to the words of the Holy Spirit. Now, to whom was this epistle written? Because a group of people, there's a lot of them today, even today, I think, but especially in the old times, who were saying that this book was written to sinners. That's a very, very wrong place to start because not one of the epistles were written to sinners. And I'll give you the reason why. If you read in the book of 1 Corinthians, it says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. That's the unsaved man. That is the man of soul receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And Hebrews chapter 3 contradicts the statement. You cannot call somebody a partaker of a heavenly calling who is unsaved. Every epistle is written to saved people. Ephesians declares that. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints. Colossians show us this. That the epistles were written by the Holy Spirit to the saints, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And here it says again, it says over there again, it says, We're for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. There you have your epistles introduction right there in the third chapter. We're for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. It is written to born again Christians. It is heretical to teach that any of these epistles are written for any other purpose but to encourage the church. They were written to born-again Messianic Jews who were in danger of apostatizing. That's who they were written to. I mean the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written to born-again Messianic Jews who were in danger 
of apostatizing and what he is trying to do is to settle them again and ground them again in the very teaching of the word of God and get them back on a right footing with the word of God and not to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ and go off under the law into apostasy because this is the major warning. You will find that there are over 10 warnings in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has warnings throughout, warnings of the Holy Spirit for the church of Jesus Christ in all ages that we need to adhere to. Now, notice something. It begins here in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1, with God, who at sundry times and diverse manners. The epistle to the Hebrews begins and testifies that the author of the word of God is who? God. In other words, it attests to the doctrine of inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's just go over there very quickly. 2 Timothy 3.16. And from a child thou hast known holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given of inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now this corresponds to Titus 2.10, that last verse, where it says not purloining, but showing good fidelity that they might adorn or wear as an ornament the doctrine of God in all things. Doctrine is vital. Now Paul is declaring here, as he does in Romans 1, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God. That's verses three and four. But it says, which he promised to fall by the prophets in the holy scriptures. God is declaring that the scriptures are sacred and they are holy and they are inspired of the Holy Spirit. That is the declaration. He is saying both Old and New Testament is inspired of the Holy Spirit. Now, what do we mean by the word inspired? It means that he literally got the word of God. God spoke through these men. God literally used these men as a mouthpiece. Now, please understand me. I'm of this view that I'm going to say. I do not believe man was an automaton when he wrote the scriptures. Because if you read the writings of the Bible, if you read all the great authors, their personalities come through. They 100% man, you see. God is using the human ability of man. You find that Paul was a very intellectual man and God used his intellect to literally write many of his great epistles, especially the book of Romans. He uses man's intellect, what he's able to do. He uses what they have studied in order for them to be able to minister. God uses both uneducated and he uses educated people. So he used the Apostle Paul with this knowledge. Paul comes through. His personality comes through. It is man speaking, but it is also God. It corresponds to the hypostatic union of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it is both God and man, fully God and fully man. So the word of God is God and man speaking, but it is perfect because it is God. It is of God. God is the author of the Old and the New Testaments. He is the literal author. Now, when certain scholars today come into view, Martin Lloyd-Jones said something very, very interesting concerning scholarship. He made the following statement. He said the evangelical Christian distrusts scholarship. And sometimes people in the evangelical church world actually put these scholars very high where they ought not to be very high. Because as I have said, if anybody says something that contradicts the very tenor of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, we have to reject what they say and accept what God says. Because many of the scholars today, and, many, and I say many of them, and I'm talking especially about textual critics, those who have gotten the Greek texts and make these modern translations, many of them 
are not born again Christians. Many of them are atheists and do not believe the word of God. If you read a man like Bruce Metzger, who's written quite a few Bibles, he will turn around and say, the first three chapters of Genesis are mythical. Now, if the first three chapters of Genesis are mythical, and he will actually say it in his notes at the bottom of the page over there, they don't believe in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. It's calling doubt on the very doctrine of man falling. God's original creation, man going into sin. It's literally causing a problem with the very doctrine of the fall. When scholars turn around and say, I don't believe it, this is some myth, this is some something that is a myth, that it really didn't happen, it's just a story. You have a problem because they impose their meaning upon the text in the notes. It calls doubt and unbelief and they say, listen here, we are not too sure whether this is true or not. It doesn't matter that the Apostle Paul spoke of the first Adam and the second Adam. It doesn't matter that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of the fall and he spoke of how the fall came in and he confirms to the fact that Adam sinned and brought in sin and transgression and man fell by a disobedience by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good. That doesn't matter. Because what matters is this, it is the ideas of the scholars, what the scholars teach. You are never, as a born-again Christian, my friend, to trust scholarship. Scholarship can get you to hell in a handbasket. That is why it's a very dangerous thing when these people begin to touch the Greek text because they impose their own meaning. And then you've got the Good News Bible that says something very interesting. In Genesis chapter 10 and 11, it says, once upon a time. Now, it tells the story of Babel. But it now says, once upon a time, bringing into the mind of the reader that the reader is actually going to experience something that they're going to think, well, this is, is, is fairy stories. We are never to trust scholars 100%. They are very, can be very dangerous. And we need to realize that we have an enemy. People like Bruce Miska and others who have tampered with the word of God call doubt on the first chapters of the book of Genesis. They call doubt on a basic Bible doctrine. They deny that the first chapters of Genesis happened. I have a problem with that. Because if you deny the first chapters of the Bible, what's saying that the rest of the Bible is true? The Bible is just some mythical idea. And that's what they reduce the word of God to. Because they're coming from a wrong precepts. When you come and you take the scriptures as God says you take it, that God is the author of the scriptures, all this other stuff, and you take him for your ultimate authority, what he says in his word, because he said it, I believe it, that settles it. You are not going to waver in your faith. You're not going to have a doubt in your mind concerning what's going on, what the word of God says. You're not going to have a doubt in your mind because you literally are upon the rock. God is unmovable and he's unshakable. So if when these scholars come along with their new discoveries and their new ideas, let me tell you something, and it contradicts the Bible, I take the Bible over the scholars. I may not be a scholar, but I take the word of God over what the scholars teach. I take the word, and I take the word at face value, that the scriptures are absolutely inerrant. And I believe, and I believe that the fall took place. And I believe mankind is in sin and depravity. I am absolutely convinced of it in the word of God. The Bible is true concerning the subject. So I believe that. So when anything comes and contradicts it, within liberalism today, or in with these liberal scholars and these liberal Protestants, or so-called Protestants, they know more Protestants than Adolf Hitler loved the Jewish people, there is a view that they also have, and that is who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, who actually wrote it. And this is a problem. And these liberals do not believe that Moses is the author of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They don't even believe that Moses is the author. Moses is not the author, according to them, and they've spoken about P and Q and a whole lot of other garbage. The problem is that the Lord Jesus Christ declared that Moses wrote the book, but they don't believe it. There is something about this modern generation that I want to call your attention to.
where they literally are getting involved in a thing of unbelief, that unbelief is becoming popular. Questioning standards of truth is becoming very, very popular. And this is a very, very dangerous thing. When people begin to question standards of truth that God has laid down in his word, they question the standard of truth. They question the word of God. And do you know the very first question of the word of God was Satan in the Garden of Eden? Has God not said? Questioning God and his authority. And here you have the scribes, these serpentine scribes, questioning what God has said. And God has declared it. Let me tell you something. You believe and trust the Bible. You believe in God, the one that is the author. I'm telling you now, no matter hell, come hell or high water, you are on great and solid ground. Because on Christ the solid rock I stand, and all of the rocks mean absolutely nothing. The Christian strength, wrote William Gurnall, the Puritan, is laid up in God and rests upon the rock of his almightiness. You have an ironclad, absolutely immovable, unshakable foundation when you believe the word of God. But there's all the stuff today going on even in the emerging church saying, well, you know, I just don't believe. There's a preacher amongst the emerging church movement. I forget his name. It's not Brian McLaren, it's not Tony Campola, it's not <coughs> Rob Bell. They enjoy their unbelief. They actually turn around and say, well, there's certain things. I'm just an atheist. There's things I just don't believe. You see, <coughs> they have gone away from the authority of the scriptures because most of these guys do not believe in prepositional truth. Or not prepositional, propositional truth. They do not believe in propositional truth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't believe there's such a thing as propositional truth. The word is propositional truth all throughout. They don't believe in the propositional truth of the word. And this guy literally glorifies in his vogue death. Well, I'm sort of an unbeliever. I don't really believe at times. You know, I, 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 I sort of believe, but I don't know if I believe. This kind of attitude for a so-called man leading a flock is disgusting. Because in the very book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews 11, it says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God because he that cometh to God must believe that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. God honors faith. Faithlessness is the sin that God hates. And it's, it really is a kindred spirit to unfaithful. When you see that word there in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, 1, it says to the faithful in Christ Jesus, to the faithful, the full of faith and those exercising faith in Christ Jesus. Loyal to the faith and established in the faith. But oh, no, 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 we're going to be these, I don't know if I believe, you know, I've got all this doubt and unbelief. Well, it's a sin that God hates. And without it, you cannot please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because God requires faith. So right there, the very action of what they're busy saying to their crowds over there amongst the emerging church leaders is totally unbiblical. We have to take God by faith. We have to take his promises by faith. And it doesn't matter what the world says. We have got to stand on the word of God, which is the rock of ages. This book is miraculous. This book, according to the very Holy Spirit that wrote it, and according to the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, this book is inspired of the Holy Spirit. It is God speaking to me now. Let's just quickly go over to the book of Second Peter very quickly. The book of Second Peter. This is Jesus speaking to me now. This is Jesus Christ in print to me. Second Peter. Chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. All the New Testament authors affirm the inspiration of the Scriptures, or the holy inspiration of the Scriptures. Verses 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. We'll deal with that in a moment. For the prophecy came in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. 
We've all maybe attended some of these Bible studies. They have these kind of Bible studies. The Methodists love it. They all sit in a circle. And the leader of the cell group will literally take his Bible and read a verse of scripture. And he will ask to the circle of people, John Wesley would freak in his grave because John Wesley knew the word of God and he knew Jesus and he was used mightily in a great revival. He would actually freak in his grave how Baxton, the Wesleyan movement and the Methodist movement has become. They sit around in this circle over there and the guy will read the scripture and he'll say, okay, okay, buddy boy, you know, tell me what you think this scripture means. And there's about 10 people. And 10 people will give their definition or what they believe that scripture is saying to them. By the time you've reached the last person, you have got a whole lot of heresy mingled with a little, maybe a, a grain of truth. Now, Peter says this is not how you deal with the scriptures. Peter is saying you don't use the word of God like a circle kind of thing. You don't use the word of God like that. You don't use the word of God and say, oh, well, you know, it's my private interpretation, my private revelation. We're not talking here about illumination, but private interpretation. Because what you are doing when you begin to do that, you are manhandling the words of the Holy Spirit. It is very, very dangerous to manhandle the word of God. This is the word of God. You can't play around with the word of God. You can't play around with the text. We have got to reverence, so to speak, this word. Because it tells me here that, that for the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. Now the term moved on there is carried along by the Holy Spirit. You put a little um, toy boat in a stream, you will see the boat is carried along by the currents. That is the idea that the Holy Spirit is trying to say. These men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the scriptures need to have a very high place in our lives. The scriptures, when we come to them, we are not to abuse the scriptures. And do you know how many people today in the charismatic movement and the evangelical church world abuse the word of the Holy Spirit and use it for their own interpretation? There are thousands that do it. And this is a very dangerous thing. You have people like Stephen Furtick, and Beth Moore, those guys are part of the Passion Conference. They read themselves into the text of Scripture. What do I mean by this? They put themselves a part of the narrative, as if they are living out the narrative and they preach themselves into the text. This is Jesus, which was coined by Chris Rosenbro. When you begin to put yourself into the text, you are actually causing a major problem because the text is not about you. The text is about Jesus. It is the gospel of God. You can't put yourself into the story by preaching about yourself as being part of that story. This is tampering with the word of God and it's nasty Jesus. There are three ways that people interpret the Bible. That's actually one of the last ways. You've got exegesis, you've got acegesis, and the final one, as I've mentioned, is nasegesis. Exegesis is taking something out of the scriptures and feeding God's people with it, giving them spiritual food, being instant in season and out of season, allowing them to grow. It is feeding them the word of God, sound doctrine to make them grow. That is what exegesis has, is. I see Jesus. Every single one of us has ICG'd at one time or another. Is reading something to, into the text that is not there. It's imposing an eisegetical meaning upon the text. Every single one of us at one time or another, especially baby Christians, do this kind of thing. And even some of the greatest men of God can get into the error of reading something into the text that is not there. I see Jesus and then there's not see Jesus. That is reading yourself into the text. And we must watch out for these because scripture is not a private interpretation. These men were men of God and they were literally carried along by the Holy Spirit. It was the very word of God that they literally were speaking. It is the word of the Holy Ghost. And therefore we as born again Christians need to have this high view. And when we come to the very message here, this is God speaking to us in the opening verses of Hebrews chapter one, where it says, God, 
who in sundry times and diverse manners. It is absolutely authoritatively declaring that God is the author of the Bible. There I said it. It is absolutely saying that he is the author of the New Testament. It is absolutely authoritatively declaring that he is the author of the Old Testament. God is the author. The triune God is the author of the Bible. The Bible is completely inspired and the Bible is completely inerrant. That's what it's saying. I've taken a long time to explain it, but that's exactly what it's saying. All scripture is given of inspiration of God. When you find a preacher coming to you and saying, oh, well, you know, I don't believe in your idea of inspiration. If it contradicts the Bible, you accept what the word of God says above what the so-called scholar or preacher or teacher. It doesn't matter if, if it's not in the Bible. As David Wilkerson said, it needs to be rejected. We are fundamentalists. We want to reclaim. The glory of fundamentalism again, the biblical idea of fundamentalism, what the word of God says. If God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. The word of God is the supreme ultimate authority. It is inspired of God. It is infallible. It is profitable for rebuke and training in righteousness that a man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It is the word of God. God is a rock, beloved. And he cannot be moved. Build your lives upon this book. I will tell you something. Everything else will sink. The world will go to hell in a sand, in, in a hand basket. But you will be immovable and unshakable. And he will see you through. That's the God that we serve. He will see you through in the situation. Because you've got this. You've got this. And we need to have a high view today of this Bible. It is the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. It's his word. Hallelujah.